Hello, I'm David Scheinbaum from Scheinbaum and Russick, and it's good to see you all again. Today I thought we would talk about some photographic books. Um, it makes sense that many of you photography collectors also collect books. I think it goes hand in hand. Typically, when you begin um, looking at images, buying images, in some cases you want to read more about the photographer, so you'll read books on history, history of photography, or books on a specific period within the photography history, or you might want to look at a monograph or a catalog that includes the work of that photographer. And, you know, as you collect and look behind me, you know, the library grows with you. Um, here at Scheinbaum and Russick, we use our library not just to gain information about the works that we have in our inventory, but we use them for research um, all the time, whether we're writing articles or essays or whether we're looking into influences, um, being able to trace uh, teachers and students or, or mentors and students. <laughs> you know, it's just very, very helpful to have books and it enhances our, our work, our collection, and our knowledge. It's not um, what typically people say, you know, if you're on a desert island, you know, what are the ten books you'd want to have with you? I'm not sure that's what I'm going to present to you today, but these are ten books that are very favorite to me, and I think through my education in photography, they're books that have meant a lot to me. And of course I'll start with my mentor's book, uh, The History of Photography by Beaumont Newhall. Um, this book probably is still the standard text on the history of photography. It's not the only history of photography that was ever written. Uh, before Beaumont wrote this book, there were other histories on technique, uh, histories of process, histories of the camera, uh, but Beaumont really was the first person to look at the practitioners of photography, to look at the artists of photography, and bring an art historical perspective to the medium. How this book came about is very interesting. Um, after Beaumont finished his studies at Harvard, he had one or two museum jobs until he finally settled as the librarian at the Museum of Modern Art. And as a librarian, he also you know, let his interest in photography be known and he became kind of the photographer for the museum photographing the exhibitions. He had a dark room in the basement of the original building and Alfred Barr, who was the director at the time, stopped Beaumont one day and basically said, how would you like to curate an exhibition on photography? And Beaumont looked at him and said, well, what is it you'd want, Mr. Barr? And Alfred Barr said, well, it's not what I want, it's what you want. And being 1937, it was very close to what would have been the 100th anniversary of the invention of photography. So Beaumont thought it appropriate to produce an exhibition of the first 100 years of the medium, which he did. In that exhibition, there were over 900 objects. And this is the fifth edition of the history of photography, but it's nice... Um, the first edition of the History of Photography, the cover was designed by Alfred Barr himself. And you can see it's designed after uh, Edward Mybridge image of the galloping horse. And this book is in five editions. It's in six or seven languages. And I would recommend those of you especially coming new to the medium, this would be a good introduction to a lot of the names, a lot of the periods, and, you know, I guess Beaumont's place as the father of the history of photography is, is well set um, because of this book. I mean, Beaumont wrote many other books after this, but this is still kind of the go-to history. After you've learned your history, I'd like to recommend this book. This is a book by John Sarkowski, who was another curator at the Museum of Modern Art. He wasn't the next one after Beaumont, after Beaumont, Edward Steichen. But after Edward Steichen came John Tchaikovsky. And, you know, people are always asking, especially to gallerists, 
people like us, you know, what makes a good photograph? This is the book that kind of answers that question. Looking at photographs looks at a number of the classical photographs by a lot of the great masters of the medium, and it talks about each image and why it's a great photograph. And it's very helpful as you're developing your own connoisseurship about imagery, about collecting. It's very helpful if you're looking for an area to target for your collecting. This is a, a good way to understand how curators, gallerists, begin to talk about pictures, begin to dialogue about pictures. So, Looking at Photographs by John Sarkowski. Another book regarding history and looking at images would be this, this little volume, which I always love to have my students read. It's by Robert Adams, and it's entitled Why People Photograph. And this book is not so much about the images as looking at photographs, but this is many of the photographers of the 20th century talking about why they photograph, what their goals are, what, they, what their intentions were, what some of their frustrations were. This is a really great book as a collector, but it's also a great book for those of you who are photographers yourself. I would highly recommend this, this little volume. I think there's one or two different covers um, you might, if you start to go to a bookstore and look at it, but um, they're all, all the editions are pretty much have the same text in there. So those are three volumes kind of dealing with history and um, commentary about photographs. In terms of books about photography, I'm going to start with this book by Nancy Newhall and Ansel Adams. Um, it's called This is the American Earth. This kind of brings us to the beginning of the Sierra Club, and this very well might be one of the first books that talk about conservation. And Nancy knew early on about how to put text and image. You know, classically, a lot of photography books would have the image in one section, then they'd have a text about the photographer or about the images. What Nancy felt is that that's very redundant and an incredible contribution that Nancy Newhall made to book publishing and to writing about photography was the idea of putting text that goes along with the image but is not redundant to the image. And I like to say it's kind of where one plus one equals three. In this book, which is about the environment, Nancy has primarily built this book around Ansel Adams' photography, but it, it contains work by Elliot Porter and William Garnett and many other photographers kind of in Ansel's circle. But the text is a, basically a prose poem that Nancy wrote that goes throughout the whole book. And her writing, to go along with these landscape photographs, uh, photographs of industry, the writing is talking about landscape, it's talking about industry, it's talking about the environment, it's talking about preservation. It's not talking about Ansel Adams and it's not talking about a specific photograph. The text is dealing with the same subjects that the photographs are dealing with. And this is, it might sound obvious, but it's incredibly innovative in the photography book world. As is another book by Nancy Nohal which is entitled Time in New England, which she produced with Paul Strand. Paul Strand spent years photographing in New England, and what Nancy um, put together with these photographs for this volume was excerpts from journals by early settlers, by people who came over on the Mayflower, by uh, people who lived in the area, uh, poetry, um, ads, articles. She also used a number of um, quotes from the writings of Thoreau. So all writing has to do with New England, all the photographs have to do with New England, but again the text isn't about Strand, it isn't about a specific uh, building or peoples, but it's about the same subjects. 
These are incredibly innovative and I would highly recommend them. Speaking of Thoreau and speaking of the Sierra Club, uh, bring us to End Wildness is the Preservation of the World. This uh, Elliot Porter book is again a very early publication by the Sierra Club and for a lot of photographers of my generation this was our first book of color photography and I don't think any of us had ever seen color. First of all it was very expensive to produce books with color and uh, when this finally came out it changed the world for a lot of photographers and a lot of collectors. Um, Elliot Porter's wife, Aline Porter, I believe recommended that he look at the work of Thoreau to pair with his imagery that goes throughout this book. So it's Elliot's photographs, it's the text of excerpts from Thoreau's writings. It's an incredible testament to the environment, again, probably one of the earliest, this along with Time in New England, probably the two, two early Sierra Club publications that are both dedicated to conservation and preservation. It's just interesting to note that this book came about with the help of Nancy Newhall, who, while, while Elliot was exhibiting his works at the George Eastman House, where Beaumont ended up becoming the director after leaving the Museum of Modern Art, and upon seeing Elliot's work, Nancy called up David Brower, who was at the Sierra Club, and basically introduced him to this work and kind of insisted on its publication. So the New Halls had a lot to do with bringing this book about. And of course, this was the beginning of an incredible career of Elliot Porter, who we feel is kind of the father of color photography. Moving to another area, I bring these two volumes. It's one book, I guess, but it's two volumes. Um, these are Edward Weston's day books. Day books are, are journals or diaries and, and Nancy Newhall again. Nancy Newhall edited these journals and, and the story is before Nancy um, showed up at Edward Weston's to begin work on this project, Edward had already done his own editing, but he edited with a razor blade. He went through all his years of journals and he, with a razor blade, he removed people's names, he, he removed certain stories, and he took out things that he didn't want known at the time. So it was a pretty difficult task for Nancy to put these together. But in the art world, there's not a lot of examples of what it's like to live the life of an artist. The frustrations, the the successes and the highs and the lows and the, the good days and the bad days and, you know, selling work, not selling work, having a show, getting a good review, having a bad review. You know, we, you know, in art history, I think people look at um, Van Gogh's letters to his brother Theo, the, the letters of Van Gogh. Those are incredible um, letters, heartfelt kind of really bearing his, his soul and on his frustrations as an artist. Here too, you know, Edward Weston shares with us um, the two volumes. One is his years in California, one is his years in Mexico. But reading these, especially as a student, really kind of gives you insight into what, it, what are you getting into? What it, is it to be a photographer? What is the life of an artist really like? Um, things have changed a lot since these books came out, but I would still, you know, if you're into Edward Weston's work, it's a must read because he talks about making a lot of his images. But again, for those of you who are photographers yourself, it's going to kind of give you a lot of insight. And believe me, after you read this and those next few years after you read these books, so much happens and you go, oh, yeah, I read that in Edward Weston's books. He wrote about this happening. He wrote about what this feels like. So I highly recommend it. And I believe now um, Aperture has republished these two volumes as a single volume. So if you're looking to purchase them, it would be Edward, it would be volume one and volume two, both bound into a single volume. 
One, probably one of the most classic and sought after books in photography collecting would be this, this book by Henri Cartier-Bresson entitled The Decisive Moment. Now, this is an early edition. There are newer editions. Um, certain books within the collecting world are almost prohibitive in, in price, unless you're a serious hardcore book collector. So you may not need the first edition of every book. But this is a book that kind of introduces us to the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson. And this term, the decisive moment, and, and you know, what it means. You know, people kind of misunderstand this term, the decisive moment to some people. Think about speed, think about quickness. But to capture the kind of the, the, the epitome of, of the action, that, that moment that it's happening, it doesn't just require speed, it actually requires observation. It requires the photographer to be at the ready before it happens. Because if you see it happening, it's kind of too late to photograph it. So if you think about that, what Bresson was a master of is being able to really see the essence of, of a scene and he sees that something is building and his camera is ready so when that peak, that moment happens, he's ready to hit the shutter. And as I said, you, you know, seeing it is kind of too late. You have to be able to, Ansel uses this term pre-visualize that we don't often like to use because it, it kind of doesn't always make sense if you really think about it. But the idea to predict something that's going to happen. This is the book that introduces that concept. This is also the book that shares with us the genius of Bresson and how he was able to elevate the 35mm camera, the small camera, to a instrument for producing art. Because even by this time, people felt, you know, serious photographers used big view cameras like, like Ansel Adams used, like Edward Weston used. And the small camera wasn't taken as seriously as those large cameras. But, of course, Bresson shows us it's not about the equipment. It's about the result and what happens. And if you're into the work of Cartier-Bresson, I also encourage you to look at your art history textbooks back from college to start looking up at the golden section or the golden mean or there's many names for basically this kind of visual formula that he used for composing his photographs and how he was able to produce image after image after image that's beautifully composed and that beautifully captures this moment. This book called The Decisive Moment, the cover of this early edition, was done by Matisse. I don't know that the later editions have the same cover, but this is an awesome book. And speaking of small format photography and what we might call reportage or street work, now this is not a first edition of The Americans. Um, this is a later edition, but Robert Frank, Swiss born photographer who basically showed us as Americans what America looks like. And at the time he was photographing, it was an America that we were not all ready to see ourselves. The segregation, the, the class structure, the, the differences between the haves and the have nots, the ironies about living the life in California, life in Florida, life in New York what's going on in this country. And this book changed everything for not only photographers, but for writers and people who were living at the time. At the time it was, it was done, it was almost too hard for people to, to look at. It wasn't a, an instant success. You know, it took some time for people to be able to digest his work. And kind of the best way to talk about Frank's photographs is to kind of draw a comparison with the writers of the B generation. Because what the writers of the B generation were writing about, that's what Robert Frank was photographing. There's an amazing introduction to this book by Jack Kerouac. And the introduction alone is one of the most beautiful pieces of writing on photography in, in, in any of these books. So 
I would highly recommend this book. And I guess lastly, and I guess this would be number 10, and not a jacket on this, this book too is kind of very uh, sought after and could be incredibly pricey as a collector, but there's many editions of it. But this book is by Minor White. It's called Mirrors, Messages, and Manifestations. And Minor is who kind of brings uh, us out of this realm of, you know, straight photography of Ansel Adams and Elliot Porter, all the philosophies of the historians, the tribulations of Edward Weston, and the street work of Bresson and Frank. Minor White brings us to a more metaphysical place, a place where we talk about photographs not, as he would say, not for what they are, but for what else they are. That even though the photograph can be a document, it can be a record, but more often than not, Minor White preferred the photograph as a transformation, as a transformative medium. And in this book, he not only shows some of his photographs, but the writings that go along with the imagery and why he, he made the images he made, why he worked with infrared, why he, you know, brings us to the philosophies of, of, of Zen Buddhism, of Gurdjieff, and of uh, uh, astrology, how it all fits in. He also puts a series of what Alfred Stieglitz called in his own work equivalence. Minor White learned the concept of equivalence from Stieglitz himself, and Minor White produced equivalents, but he produced them in, in sequences, not as single images, but as series of images. So this book contains, you know, all of these various approaches that Minor had to his own work, but it also captures a, a, an experimental aspect of photography um, that was new at the time, and there's a number of photographers that are still working today kind of following the legacy that Minor White left for us. And even though this would be number 10, there's the bonus book of number 11. And speaking of Minor White, and this is again probably less for you photography collectors, but more for you photographers. This little book is called Zen and the Art of Archery. It's, um, it's a story about approaching archery, but archery is kind of a metaphor in this book. Um, Minor used this book as a textbook for his students. Many photographers um, that teach continue to give this book to their students as the primary text for photographing. Because if you think about that notion of using your bow and striking the target, possibly getting a bullseye, and think of that process metaphorically, and rather than have a bow, but substitute that for your camera, and think of your film or your digital card as your arrow, possibly. It's metaphorically an amazing um, book that teaches us what it takes to really approach photography at a very high level. That's kind of my 10 for today. If I was to do this uh, a week from now, I might have a different 10 books. But um, this kind of answers, you know, a lot of people come to the gallery and, you know, they look at, our, at the work and they talk to Janet or Andre or, and I and they say, you know, I'm interested in learning about photography. What book should I get? You know, this is more in that vein. You know, I think these 10 books would be a, a good, maybe first 10 books for your, to begin your library or if you already have a library and it doesn't contain one of these books, I think it should. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, check out our website, which is photographydealers.com. These videos uh, appear on our website under History of Photography, but it also appears on a, a YouTube page um, under the titles of Straight Talk on Collecting Photography. Thanks again, take care, and we'll see you next time.